This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. in the Pacific was fought under the most trying conditions, difficult terrain and extremes of climate. There were few more miserable battlegrounds anywhere in the world than the steaming jungles of disease-ridden New Guinea. The men who fought across the 1,500-mile Long Island experienced war at its worst. There was always a good chance that a sniper might be concealed only a few yards away. In New Guinea, the Allied fighting man could never be certain that the enemy was in any one place. In Australia, during 1942 and 43, the attention of everyone on that island continent was concentrated on the road back, a series of campaigns to be made by Allied forces under the overall command of General Douglas MacArthur. When I landed on your soil, I said to the people of the Philippines whence I came, I shall return. Tonight, I repeat those words. Yeah, 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 yeah. I shall return. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing is more certain than the ultimate reconquest and liberation from the enemy of those and adjacent lands. By late 1943, the road back against the enemy lay principally along the northern coast of New Guinea, up the tail of the bird-shaped island. By December, U.S. Marines and soldiers had moved virtually all the way up the Solomon Islands chain. To westward, U.S. and Australian forces attacked the enemy in the Bismarck Archipelago area. On December 15th, the strategically situated island of New Britain was invaded. The assault was made by the Army's 112th Cavalry Regiment, 1,700 strong. The invasion craft were attacked by more than 30 Japanese planes. The invasion was carried out successfully, despite intense air activity over the landing beaches. soldiers in the assault waves hadn't expected to be hit before reaching the beach. At Arawa, for the first time in a combat operation, rockets were used to soften up the beaches. The landings were successfully achieved in spite of the heavy enemy air attack. and a beachhead was established. Attached to the 158th Infantry Regiment at Arawa was a group of American Indians who were used chiefly as scouts. Stealthily seeking out enemy troop concentrations was a specialty of the Indians throughout the war in many Pacific battles. Ground Forces officers came to appreciate how valuable the Indians were in their reconnaissance assignments. Silent and sure-footed, the Indian scouts went out on mission after mission behind the enemy lines. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans. With exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. 
Whether it's exploring the ruins and secrets of the Second World War, or rediscovering lost stories from the front of the First World War, there is a war story waiting for you on History Heat. With an unrivaled catalogue of military history documentaries, it is a must-have for any lover of history. Not only that, but we have a huge podcast network releasing new episodes every day, so you'll always have something to listen to. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. In a war which called for the employment of stealth and deception, the Indians were beating the enemy at his own game. In addition to serving as scouts and snipers, the Indians often functioned as couriers. They were most adept at carrying important messages safely through territory not yet completely won. In the South and Southwest Pacific, another small group of men called Coast Watchers played a major part in many Allied victories in that area. Coast Watchers were men who were thoroughly familiar with the territory held by the enemy. Top priority information on weather conditions and on the enemy's latest activities was gathered by these volunteers who worked with the help of friendly natives behind enemy lines. Discovery, of course, would mean instant death. The Coast Watchers, most of whom were Australian, transmitted this vital information to the Allies by radio. After each transmission, the CW would usually be forced to change his location to circumvent discovery by the enemy. If the message got through successfully to Allied units in the area, an invasion force or air or naval strike group could move in on enemy targets more quickly and also cut down on their own casualties. In late December 1943, after the Arawa diversion, a U.S. invasion was planned at another point on western New Britain, at Cape Gloucester. In a pre-invasion strike, U.S. 5th Air Force planes strafed enemy positions and dropped 400 tons of bombs on the beaches. was begun on the day after Christmas, 1943. The assault troops were 1st Division Marines. Most of the men in the assault waves were veterans of the long, bloody campaign fought by the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal. Commanded by Marine General William Rupertus, the troops went quickly about the business of launching the invasion. The scheduled plan for the assault on Cape Gloucester was executed successfully by the invasion force of Marines. Resistance was not expected to be heavy, but then no one could be entirely certain. The main landing was made on the east coast of Cape Gloucester. The beaches had been thoroughly softened up by pre-invasion bombardments, and enemy opposition was light. An unusual situation for marine assault waves in the Pacific in 1943. With the beachhead quickly seized, tanks came ashore, and the drive was on for the capture of the all-important airfield. Though the enemy wasn't particularly troublesome for the first few days, the great morass of mud slowed the marine advance down. But the riflemen, working closely with the tanks, kept pushing inland without pause. The marine tank crews handled their vehicles adroitly in the matted jungle, drawing praise from the army. Every effective weapon was used against the dug-in enemy. After 22 days, the enemy was largely put to rout.
The Marines carved up the disorganized clusters of enemy troops who hadn't fled toward Rabaul. The U.S. had succeeded to complete control of western New Britain. The enemy was fast losing his South Seas empire. The attack on Rabaul on the far eastern tip of New Britain was stepped up in early 1944. Thousands of tons of bombs were dropped on the enemy's one-time stronghold. In a six-month campaign, U.S. planes knocked out Japan's most powerful base on the Southwest Pacific. Rabaul was rendered completely useless to the enemy. For the ground forces, there was one more important area in the Bismarck Archipelago, the Admiralty Islands. The U.S. command decided that they must be taken. Before the actual invasion of the islands, a reconnaissance party went ashore on Los Negros to determine the enemy's strength. For 24 hours, they took stock and discovered that the island, seemingly deserted though it looked, was actually heavily garrisoned. It had been decided to assault Los Negros first and then invade Manus, the larger island. The G.I.s, who were experiencing their baptism of fire, headed toward shore on the morning of February 29th, 1944. Less than two dozen U.S. planes appeared, owing to poor weather. The assault soldiers were expecting heavy resistance on the beaches. A good percentage of the G.I.s landed successfully. But once ashore, they found themselves in a furious battle against a determined enemy. It was a rough fight. In the campaign on the Admiralties, U.S. ground forces suffered some 1,200 casualties. Thanks to blood plasma and newly developed drugs, many of the men who had been badly wounded were saved. With the capture of the two principal islands in the Admiralties, the entire Bismarck area was sealed off. The U.S. forces now controlled the strategic airstrips which had been used with great effectiveness by the enemy. The quickening offensive in New Guinea required the use of all available army divisions. General Frederick Irving sped the 24th on its way into combat. You're about to embark on your great adventure. Probably the greatest adventure has occurred to you during your lifetime. The operation we've been looking forward to for a long time. We're all ready. Now, the few miscellaneous things that I want to mention tonight. First is, I want to prepare you mentally for the confusion of combat. If you keep quiet, the Jap does not know anything about you. But as soon as you fire your rifle, it's the same as saying, here I am same time you have little chance of hitting anybody in the dark. You have a big chance of hitting your own men. So keep that in mind. Firing at night, spasmodically and so forth, is a mark of ill-disciplined and untrained troops. I don't expect any of that in this division. In conclusion, I want to wish you the best of luck in this operation. These organizations have a grand reputation. I know that when the story of this war is written, you'll have more than your share of decorations and honors, and that there'll be no units, no combat team that will equip themselves any better than will this combat team here. The next jump in the leapfrog operation up the back of the New Guinea bird was to Itape, some 400 miles westward. The offensive force was a powerful one. 
the largest fleet to support any landing in the Southwest Pacific Theater up to this point, accompanied an assault force of some 22,500 troops. A large proportion of the soldiers who were to make the invasion at Itapay were battle-wise veterans of earlier New Guinea engagements, like the men of the 163rd Infantry Regiment. We'd been in a few scraps with the enemy on New Guinea, but nothing this big. This time it looked as though we were really going to throw a punch. It was quite a show. The bombardment cheered us all up. The more those big guns pounded the beaches, the fewer Japs there would be to meet us when we went ashore. We started for the beach soon after dawn. We were all a little nervous, and that choppy sea didn't help that feeling in the pit of the stomach. Funny thing, but no matter how many combat landings you made, you never completely got over that case of nerves just before the battle. Once the shooting started on shore, the spell was usually broken, and you'd be so busy keeping on the alert that you wouldn't have time to be nervous. The initial resistance to the landing at Itape was relatively light, but as the battle progressed, U.S. forces were subsequently to cut off and chop up the enemy's entire 18th Army. At the same time, a larger U.S. force was landing some 125 miles farther west at Hollandia in Dutch New Guinea. Invasions were made at two points along the coast. Opposition on both beaches was light. The first phase of the attack was carried out according to plan. The men of the Army's 41st and 24th Divisions executed the operation without a hitch. The first wave has landed on the schedule and had no opposition. Swell. Could be better. Thanks. The plan called for the troops to drive quickly inland toward the three airfields, which were the principal objectives. In the use of the northern New Guinea coastal area, the troops were faced with a serious transportation problem. Now and then, the GIs encountered the enemy. But they offered no serious problem. With the two invasion forces linked up, the sought-after airfields in the Santani area fell to the U.S. after only five days. But it soon became apparent that because of the swampy terrain, the strips could not be built into major bases. A month later, U.S. forces moved 145 miles farther west along the bird's back. By seizing an area on the New Guinea coast at Tum, artillery could be employed to shell the real objective, the island of Wakta, two miles offshore. From the beachhead near Tum, assault troops launched the shore-to-shore -shore invasion of Wakta Island. Spearhead of that assault was the 163rd Infantry Regiment, the same men who had landed at Itape three weeks earlier. For some reason, somebody decided that we had to have walked the island, probably because the airfield was a little better than the last ones we took. It was a short but tough battle. The enemy troops on Wakta were well dug in, and we had to use our most efficient weapons for getting at them and knocking them out of the battle. We killed almost 800 in the two-day fight on Wakta. Eight days later, U.S. soldiers made still another landing at Biak, 180 miles westward in Gilvink Bay. Just before the landing, the rocket ships went to work. Rockets were proving more effective than naval gunfire in last-minute bombardments of the invasion beaches. The GIs of the 41st Division who made the assault on Biak were expecting a rough time once they arrived on shore. 12,000 men went ashore on Biak on that first day. 
12 medium tanks were landed during the first 10 hours. The battle at Biak didn't get started in earnest until the U.S. force was well established ashore. U.S. Shermans were to play a responsible part in the Allied victory in the pitched battle. Biak turned into one of the most hotly contested engagements in the Southwest Pacific Theater. The enemy refused to surrender the island. Two and a half weeks after the battle on Biak began, General Robert L. Eichelberger was placed in command of the ground forces with orders to bring the bloody fight to a successful conclusion. For the second time in New Guinea, General Eichelberger cleaned up a messy operation. In early July, another hop to Numfur Island carried the U.S. drive 80 miles still farther west. The small island in Gilvink Bay was invaded by some 7,000 GIs of the 158th Regimental Combat Team. The assault force expected to encounter heavy opposition on the only beach where a landing was feasible. But the initial beachhead was established quickly and with comparative ease. The U.S. invasion force outnumbered the enemy on Noom 4 by three or four to one. Once more, the GIs were prepared for a grueling campaign. But the U.S. command had overestimated the enemy's strength on the island. Against light resistance, the G.I.s moved quickly across the island. But the command still expected trouble and called for reinforcements to be dropped by parachute over the recently seized airfield. The paratroopers making the jump were the men of the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment, most of them veterans of the drop on Natsap earlier in the New Guinea campaign. But this time, the operation was poorly executed. The troopers had been scheduled to drop a distance of at least 400 feet, but some were disgorged from the planes at heights as low as 175 feet. In addition, the planes should have flown in single file rather than two abreast. And the landing area chosen was so narrow that only a part of the group managed to land on the field. Many of the men missed the drop zone some by a wide margin. Of the 739 men who made the initial jump at Noom 4, almost 10% were casualties and not related in any way to enemy action. Nevertheless, by the fifth day, all three airfields on Noom 4 were in U.S. possession and all that was left was mopping up. Noom 4 was by no means the final objective in the New Guinea campaign. In late July, the next hop to Sansapore took the U.S. forces to the head of the New Guinea bird. The landing was not opposed, but the 20,000 GIs of the 6th Division were taking no chances. The assault was made against an enemy which was discovered to be in the process of evacuating the area. U.S. forces had succeeded in driving across the length of New Guinea to the very tip of the 1,500-mile Long Island. In mid-September, U.S. soldiers invaded Moratai, an island in the Moluccas, lying between New Guinea and the Philippines. With this engagement, the New Guinea campaign was successfully concluded, a never-to-be-forgotten experience in the lives of the men who fought there, from the greenest private to General Eichelberger. Historians will state that the two-year fight for New Guinea was one of the toughest in modern warfare. I agree with that. The men who served under my command in New Guinea from 1942 until late 44 fought day and night under conditions which would have broken the spirit of less stout-hearted troops. Fighting on that terrain in that abominable climate and against an enemy as resourceful as the Japanese was tough enough. But the tropical diseases, malaria, dengue fever, scrub typhus, jungle rot provided the finishing touches. The fact that we won that most vital island after some 20 odd months of dogged battling is a tribute to the fighting qualities of the American soldier. While my gratitude goes out to our brothers of the Navy and Air as an infantry commander, I must say that New Guinea was a war of infantry, United States and Australia. And by virtue of our victory on New Guinea, the invasion of the Philippines was made possible.
While the leapfrogging hops were made in the Southwest Pacific, U.S. amphibious forces in the Central Pacific were engaged in their own campaign of island hopping. The Marianas were a most strategically important invasion target in June 1944. By the end of summer 1944, American forces were well established in the Marianas only 1,500 miles from Tokyo. In the Southwest Pacific, U.S. Army troops had swept to the western tip of New Guinea. But further progress from both of those newly won positions demanded the securing of the flank. Between western New Guinea and the Marianas lay a small group of islands in the Carolines called Palau. To the top strategists of the Pacific War, the problem was, must heavily defended Palau be taken? In the late summer of 1944, the Allied advance on the Western Pacific pointed to a quickening schedule of invasions. Morotai and the Halmahera group was an obvious target on the drive from New Guinea. On the right flank of that route lay Palau. The necessity for the invasion of the Palau Islands was discussed by the top Army and Navy commanders in the Pacific at great length. General MacArthur, intent on retaking the Philippines, felt that Palau must be seized to secure his right flank and also to provide a base from which air cover could be furnished for the Philippine operation. Admiral Nimitz agreed. Admiral Halsey, on the other hand, felt that the Palau campaign was not really necessary. During September, Halsey's third fleet was on the prowl in the waters off the southern Philippines and launched its planes in attacks against enemy airfields on those islands. The carrier plane's attacks were highly successful. Because of the light opposition to these carrier raids on the Philippines, Halsey recommended that Palau be bypassed, a recommendation which was not followed by his superiors. At home in the late summer of 1944, America was demonstrating that she was fully capable of waging warfare successfully against the enemies in Europe and in Asia. Less than three years after Pearl Harbor, U.S. industry was achieving miracles in producing the machines and weapons of war in unbelievable quantities. America was geared completely to the demands of the two ocean war. Supply groups on both sides of the world was the nation's number one business. By the late summer of 44, America's millions had adjusted with good grace to the inconveniences and shortages of wartime living. America was solidly behind the two wars being fought on far-flung battlefields. On Main Street and on Broadway, U.S. citizens were investing in that war. To shorten the time needed to win that war, the people, young and old, directed all their energies toward one goal, the backing up of American fighting men. Of course, everybody had to relax once in a while, especially the servicemen just back from the front. And there was a good deal to be happy about. Paris had been liberated, and Patton was racing across France. Most Americans felt it wouldn't be too long before the Nazis were knocked out of the war. Then the U.S. could rarely go to work on Japan. Mounting confidence was evident all over the United States. But there were constant reminders, too, that the war wasn't quite won, that there were still costly battles to be fought. In the Western Pacific in early September 1944, the war was being carried forward toward eventual final victory by the powerful amphibious forces which were driving deeper into the enemy's zone of defense. The immediate objective was the group of islands called Palau. To seize the most strategically important islands in that chain, a force of sizable proportions was dispatched, assigned to bombard and invade the designated target islands in mid-September. 
The decision on which islands of the group to invade was a difficult one. The largest number of Japanese troops was concentrated on Babel Tuop, the largest island. Less than half as many enemy troops garrisoned Pelalu, which also had an airstrip. A relatively small force defended Angaur, which was in a commanding position at the base of the Palau chain. The amphibious force which moved northwestward through the far Pacific was to strike at the last two of those islands, Pelalu and Angaur. The naval and troop commanders checked over the planned invasions for the last time. On September 15, 1944, the assault was begun on Pelalu Island by the men of the 1st Marine Division. The last pre-invasion airstrikes were made, concluding three days of softening up enemy strong points by strafing and bombing. Pelalu was to be invaded and captured so that U.S. forces would gain possession of the vitally important airfield on the island, a key to the control of the Western Pacific area. Before the assault troops stormed ashore on Pelalu, the approaches to the beach were prepared for the first waves of boats. This delicate and hazardous job fell to the underwater demolition teams, composed of selected Navy and Marine volunteers, popularly known as frogmen. The underwater demolition men had to be able to swim long distances underwater and to work well completely on their own. The frogmen had to work quickly, first in locating the obstacle to be removed, natural or artificial, and then to set the high explosive charge correctly under the most difficult conditions. Then the trick was to get back to the pickup boat without being spotted by the enemy. Once safely out of the immediate area, the job was completed. During the latter years of World War II, the frogmen enabled many invasions to go off smoothly. Early on D-Day morning, the Navy's warships sought to soften up the beaches by the final pre-invasion bombardment. Though the battle on shore was expected to be another Tarawa, the Navy complained that they had run out of targets. But there were many installations which the Navy's guns did not even touch. As H hour neared, the combat information center aboard ship became the nerve center of the operation. At 6.30 on D-Day morning, the amphibian tractors carrying their complement of assault troops started for the line of departure, the area from which the final dash to the beach would be begun. The landing craft, each one a part of a designated wave, rendezvoused before making the coordinated move toward the beaches. In the Palalu invasion, each step of the operation by each unit was reported to the top commanders on the command ship. They were thus able to gain an overall picture of the situation. Wave one for final line of departure at 0825. On deck, the troop commanders watched anxiously as the landing craft moved toward the beaches. The assault troops were preceded by a rocket barrage directed against the area behind the landing beaches. Resistance on Pelalu was expected to be heavy. As the armored amphibians moved toward shore, they drew heavy fire from the enemy, a good indication of what was in store on the beaches. As the landing craft neared the shore, the atmosphere aboard the command ship became charged with tension. Each message received from the assault units helped fill in a vital part of the broad mosaic of the battle for the beachhead. This was the first amphibious assault made by the 1st Marine Division to be opposed by the enemy. The landings at Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester, New Britain, had been nothing like this. In the Marine Corps, the 1st Division had earned the reputation of drawing operations which entailed easy landings. But at Pelalu, this tradition of good luck was dissipated. The first waves hit the beach to the accompaniment of intense enemy mortar and artillery fire. The prediction that it would be rough turned out to be an understatement. 
Casualties on the beaches were heavy. The 1st Marine Division was paying dearly for the small strip of coral and sand along Pelalieu's western shore. To hold on to the slim foothold, the Marines had to drive quickly inland to deepen their beachhead. In the face of withering enemy fire, they pushed ahead. On the left flank, the battle was particularly tough. The 3rd Battalion of the 1st Marine Regiment ran into very heavy opposition. A brutal fight developed. On D-Day on Peleliu, the situation reports on the fierce and confused fighting were relayed regularly to the top command. The line against the enemy was broken by two major gaps, so serious that the position of the entire U.S. force on the island was endangered. Fire one. We are under heavy infrared fire. The critical situation was followed with careful attention to every minute detail by the commanders of the operation on the command ship offshore. On the afternoon of D-Day on Peleliu, the Marines found themselves faced with the necessity of stopping a strong enemy counterattack. The men of the 1st Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, braced themselves for the attack. At 4.50 o'clock, the Marines opened up with everything they had. In the savage battle, American tanks once again took the measure of the obsolete Japanese models. The enemy counterattack failed completely and ended in a familiar way. The first objective for which the Marines were fighting so bitterly was the airfield on Peleliu. To seize that airstrip, the exhausted Marines pushed on in a determined effort to gain that prize before nightfall. By the late afternoon, the Marines had possession of part of that objective. But the conquest of Peleliu wasn't to be as brief as originally planned. The biggest obstacle to the Marines' progress was Bloody Nose Ridge. Hold up inside many of the peaks in that ridge, the Japanese troops could exist for a long period, could enter and leave by any one of a number of passages. It was up to the Marines to clean the enemy out of every cave entrance, and they attacked the job with great determination. The fight to take Bloody Nose Ridge on Peleliu was one of the toughest spot actions of the entire Pacific War. Casualties in the lines were taken back to a more protected area, but sometimes that job was almost impossible. Many of the casualties were taken to a safer position behind the front, right under the sights of the enemy's guns. During the first two days, one company alone suffered 67% casualties. It became apparent that this was to be no quick operation. As often as possible, badly wounded Marines were taken off the island entirely, out of range of the enemy's fire. During many of the Pacific campaigns, the wounded American serviceman was transferred quickly to a waiting hospital ship standing by offshore. Often, the entire trip from the front lines to the sanctuary of the ship's hospital took less than an hour. Many of the difficult surgical cases would not have been saved in former wars. Indeed, the advances made in medical science during World War II helped keep U.S. casualties at a minimum. Thanks directly to the efficient work of the Army and Navy doctors and the nurse corps, the lives of thousands of American fighting men were saved. The invasion of Angaur was made by the Army's 81st Division on September 17th, two days after the assault on Peleliu. The 81st, nicknamed the Wildcat Division, was commanded by General Paul Mueller, who led his troops into combat for the first time on Angaur. After the customary softening up of the beaches, the men of the 81st landed against light resistance and went about the job of seizing the island from the enemy garrison force. Angaur was not heavily defended, but the enemy had to be wiped out yard by yard. The GIs on Angaur suffered some casualties too, but fortunately not a high percentage of the troops committed. The frontline work of the army medics under fire was notable. 
For four days, the GIs pressed the attack on Angaur. On September 20th, all organized resistance ceased. The enemy's defense of Angaur had crumbled. The island was declared officially secure on that fourth day. Without any loss of time, army engineers went to work on the construction of an airstrip on the island. The work of clearing the area was carried forward under enemy sniper fire. The field on Angaur would provide a second bomber strip in the Palau's and would lessen the amount of traffic on the Palau strip. Construction was continued even after dark. The GI in charge of the lights which flooded the area was ready to pull the switch in a second if an alert was sounded. On Pelalu, the Marines were having a tougher time dealing with the enemy in the caves of Bloody Nose Ridge, a fortress which was proving virtually impregnable to the Marines' continuing attacks. Progress was slow. The Marines advanced slightly, only to be stopped after each small gain. Sometimes the Marines would be thrown back from their newly won position. The call for air support was quickly answered. The men on the ground took a short breather while Marine pilots went to work on the enemy. The crescendo of the howitzers prefaced each new attack. Some areas of Bloody Nose Ridge were fought for several times. On Pelalu, advances were often measured in terms of a few yards. Once in a great while, the Marines gave their weapons a short rest. The Navy hospital corpsmen had plenty to do. Casualties were mounting at an alarming rate. General William Rupertus felt that his 1st Marine Division could carry on without help. But his superior, 3rd Amphibious Corps Commander Marine General Roy Geiger, felt that it would be wise to bring in, as reinforcement, a regimental combat team from the Army's 81st Division relatively fresh after the short struggle on Angaur. The GIs of the 321st Infantry Regiment were to relieve a badly chewed up Marine Regiment, the first, which had been clawing at the enemy at Bloody Nose Ridge for eight straight days. The soldiers were to work with elements of the 7th Marine Regiment in the drive north to secure the northern section of Palalu. The Army troops edged around the ridge and approached it from the north in a move coordinated with marine attacks from the sides of the ridge. Some of the marines were assisted by war dogs who were trained to detect the enemy's presence. The fight for Bloody Nose raged on. From the airfield on Pelalu, marine pilots took off on the shortest bomb run in World War II in the Pacific, 1,000 yards to the target. Bloody Nose Ridge, more formally called Umabrogal Mountain. Sometimes the planes dropped napalm-filled belly tanks with instantaneous fuse mechanisms. The results were most effective. Napalm, which had first been used against the enemy on Tinium, often proved more devastating than regular bombs particularly on jagged terrain. Week after week, U.S. troops assaulted Bloody Nose Ridge with every weapon available. A favorite weapon of Japanese soldiers on suicide missions was the Bangalore torpedo. 
While the campaign on Palaliu was continuing, it became apparent that a supplementary operation would have to be conducted against an adjoining island, Ngesimus, which was given a once-over by the marine pilots. On September 28th, Marines of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, conducted a well-executed shore-to-shore operation from Peleliu to Ngesibus. This small-scale invasion was necessary to deny the enemy the use of a base for his artillery, which was being directed against U.S. troops on Peleliu. Ngesibus was seized without too much difficulty by the 1,000th Marines. The island was taken quickly, and U.S. losses were light. On Palaliu, the fight for Bloody Nose continued without let-up. By the end of September, the enemy was losing control of the island. A number of Japanese soldiers surrendered. But they represented only a part of the force still alive on Peleliu. For every enemy soldier who gave himself up, there were many more still holed up in the caves of Bloody Nose Ridge. On Peleliu, a handful of Japanese troops were taken alive before the island was turned secure. As for the rest, the U.S. forces spent another eight weeks sealing up cave entrances in the last pocket of enemy resistance an area about 900 yards long and 400 yards wide. By late November, the enemy was all finished on Palau. In taking two key islands in the Palau's, U.S. fighting men had seized a valuable area in the far reaches of the Western Pacific. The stars and stripes flew over the most westerly of the Carolyn Islands after a campaign which ranked with the most bitterly fought of the war in the Pacific. From that territory, one at a cost of more than 1,600 American lives, U.S. forces were in position for their next move. In October, a sizable airstrip capable of accommodating heavy bombers was in operation on Angaur. From that field, U.S. bomber pilots made periodic runs over some of the islands in the Palau group which had not been invaded by American amphibious forces. The pilots concentrated on enemy positions on Babeltuap and Koror. Occasionally, these routine missions proved fatal. But gradually, the air over the Western Pacific came under U.S. control. With Moratai and the Moluccas functioning as one air base and the Palau's as another, U.S. planes could easily cover the forthcoming invasion of the Philippines. Starting in October, U.S. bombers operating from Palau attacked Japanese fields and installations in the Philippines. And just one month after D-Day at Palau, U.S. invasion forces were en route to the long-awaited invasion of the Philippine Islands. For freedom and justice, for the truth, he let us depart.